In the early weeks of 1942, as battle raged in Western Europe and North Africa, the Japanese threat to invade Malaya and Singapore became a reality. It was unthinkable to the British that the island they'd nicknamed the Gibraltar of the East could fall, and yet fall it did, with dire and terrible consequences. Some 80,000 prisoners of war were taken in Singapore, 50,000 more in Malaya. No wonder British Prime Minister Churchill described it as the worst disaster and largest capitulation in British history. But before the events of 1942 unfolded, the Japanese had had to neutralize the possibility of American intervention. They were thirsty for resources. They had no source of oil to speak of, having lost a shattering 93% of their supply after US President Franklin D. Roosevelt ordered an embargo in July 1941. Although the Japanese enjoyed an oil treaty with the Dutch, that too was broken as the Netherlands joined the embargo. Starved of oil, metal and other resources, Japan could either draw back and lose face or seek to find the resources it needed elsewhere. Those resources lay in the South Pacific. The US Pacific Fleet was the only force capable of challenging Japan's navy. The Americans had bases in the Philippines, which could threaten lines of communication between the Japanese home islands and the East Indies. Every oil tanker heading for Japan would have to pass by American-held Luzon. On December 7, 1941, the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force laid waste to much of the American fleet and Air Force stationed at Pearl Harbor. was a strike of such audacity, it almost defied belief. President Roosevelt described it as a date which will live in infamy. No longer could America take an isolationist view. The war could no longer be seen as a purely European conflict. On December 8th, the U.S. Congress had voted that a state of war existed between the United States and Japan. On December 11th, the Axis countries of Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. Congress immediately recognized the existence of a state of war with Germany and Italy. The U.S. was now at war on all fronts. <laughs> 
The conflict in the Pacific and the war in Europe had different causes. Part of the reason they became entangled was Adolf Hitler's decision to declare war on America in the hours after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And yet, the Japanese had requested no help from him, and even if they had, he had none to offer. There were those in America who did not relish the prospect of fighting in the Pacific and in Europe. And yet Hitler's decision to declare war meant that the world's two greatest military and industrial powers, America and Russia, were now aligned against him. The main cause of war in the Pacific, as we shall see, was Japan's decision to spread its empire further. What Britain had done a hundred years before, Japan now sought to copy. For the Japanese, there was no such thing as the Second World War. For them, it was the Greater East Asia War, a conflict that had begun not in 1939, but in 1931 with the invasion of Manchuria. China was the great enemy. With 65 million mouths to feed, Japan's military decided the only way to support the population was expansion. The Japanese had been cruel invaders of China, seeking the glory of empire, but also the wealth that lay beyond her borders in larger markets for her industry. However, the wealth Japan sought to take by invasion belonged at that time to European colonial powers. The French were in Indochina, the Dutch in the East Indies, and Britain in Malaya, Singapore and Burma. With the colonial powers fighting a war in Europe, their military capabilities were stretched. Japan chose this moment to pounce. But if Japan was to be successful in moving against these old colonial powers, it had to keep the American Pacific Fleet from coming to their aid. The assault on Pearl Harbor gave them the edge they sought. Japan struck hard and fast, attacking American possessions in the Pacific, the Philippines, Wake Island and Guam. Midway Island was shelled by Japanese warships. It was a pattern to be repeated over and over again. They then moved on mainland Asia. Hong Kong, what the Japanese called the Citadel of British Imperialism in China, was hit by air and sea. Airfields in Malaysia felt the full force of the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force. Singapore was bombed. Japanese troops landed in the north of Malaya and southern Thailand. America's main airbase in the Philippines, Clark Field, came under attack. In the Philippines, the main island of Luzon was hit, as was British Borneo, where the only Allied ground unit, an outnumbered Indian battalion of the 15th Punjab Regiment, managed to resist for 10 weeks before it was overwhelmed. After a week of fighting on Christmas Day 1941, the British garrison at Hong Kong fell. It had held on longer than anyone had expected. Isolated at the southeastern tip of China, Hong Kong had been considered expendable. Yet 6,000 defenders had held off 40,000 Japanese. The end came when the colony's reservoirs were taken. There was nothing to do but surrender. The Japanese campaign in Burma took much longer. Burma was a prize highly sought. It provided the British with a gateway to India, the jewel in the colonial crown. 
What's more, since 1938, the Burma Road that ran from Mandalay to Kunming had been the only overland supply route for the nationalist forces fighting the Japanese in China. With the Americans wrongly believing that China would contribute a mighty force to help the defeat of Japan, it was essential that the road remain open and China was kept supplied. With China joining the Allies and declaring war on Germany, Italy and Japan, the American general Joseph Stilwell, Vinegar Joe as he was known, joined the Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek as his chief of staff. Though they were successful in repulsing a Japanese attack in China on January 15th, their success was short-lived. The Japanese were already in Burma and they did not let the dense jungle hinder their ambitions. Where roads were blocked, they simply took to the undergrowth. British-trained Burmese forces were unable to halt their advance. Japan's first objective was Rangoon, Burma's only port. They reached it and took it in early March. When Japanese forces gained control of the Burmese end of the road, they had succeeded not only in gaining the rich resources of oil and rubber Burma had to offer, but also in closing China's land links to the Allies. Burma would remain in Japanese hands until May 1945. In the Commonwealth of the Philippines, the Allied forces were commanded by General Douglas MacArthur, the Philippines had been officially made a territory of the United States as far back as 1902. In the months leading up to the war, days were languid, given over to ceremonies, inspections and training. Officers and their wives occupied their evenings and weekends with social events and rounds of golf, while the soldiers enjoyed the delights on offer in the bars of Manila. Defending the thousands of islands that compromised the Philippines was a nightmare. They lay 8,000 miles from the American west coast, but only 200 miles from Japanese-held Formosa. To defend them, General MacArthur had the equivalent of two divisions of regular troops, 16,000 US regulars and 12,000 Philippine scouts. He could call on additional thousands of Philippine militia, but they were untrained and ill-equipped, hardly a force strong enough to stand up to the might of the Imperial Japanese Army. American strategists had developed two plans to counter possible Japanese aggression, one for the Navy, another for the Army. The Navy planned to fight across the Central Pacific for a climactic and decisive battle with the Japanese fleet. The army saw no way to save the Philippines and favoured a strategic defence along an Alaska-Hawaii-Panama line. But writing off the Philippines was politically impossible. As war drew ever closer, frantic efforts were made to strengthen the Commonwealth's defences. Both General MacArthur and Army Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall, who commanded US forces in Hawaii, overestimated the abilities of their own forces and greatly underestimated the strength and ability of the Japanese. In particular, they grossly exaggerated the power of the new B-17 Flying Fortress bomber, a few of which were rushed to the Philippines in the last days of peace. Their efforts proved too little too late. With the US Pacific Fleet paralyzed at Pearl Harbor, the Japanese Imperial Army Air Force now turned their attention to the Philippines and caught the US Air Force on the ground. 
Japan had total air supremacy. A stockpile of torpedoes was destroyed, US submarines were rendered useless. Only MacArthur's beleaguered American Filipino army held out on the main Philippine island of Luzon. The Japanese army landed in the north on December 22, 1941, and began to push southward toward Manila. At first, MacArthur was inclined to meet the Japanese on the beaches, but with no air force and only able to call on the Navy's tiny Asiatic fleet, he was in no position to challenge Japan at sea. Though the US regulars and Philippine scouts were excellent troops, the reality was they were truly outnumbered. After two weeks' hard fighting, the American and Filipino troops withdrew to the Bataan Peninsula on the west side of Manila Bay. There, MacArthur could pursue a strategy of defense and delay, shortening his lines and using the mountainous jungle-covered terrain to his advantage. Furthermore, he could deny the Japanese the use of Manila as a port. Perhaps he could even hold out long enough for a relief force to be mounted in the United States. But it wasn't just bullets and shells the Allies were faced with. The Japanese launched a propaganda war in the skies over the Philippines, dropping thousands of leaflets on Allied troops, insisting they had no hope pressing for their surrender. But there was no capitulation. On 26th of December 1941, MacArthur declared Manila an open city. It would not be fought over. On January 2nd, Manila and the US naval base at Cavite were captured. MacArthur directed operations from his base on the island fortress of Corregidor. Though the Bataan Peninsula was well fortified, it was horribly overcrowded. 106,000 troops and civilians. There was too little food and too little ammunition. Sickness and malnutrition set in. The American Filipino force, racked by dysentery and malaria, continued to fight, but disease and lack of proper sustenance claimed more lives than the enemy. By March, it was clear that help from the United States was not coming. Nevertheless, the Allies valiantly held out for four months. Though the attempt to hold the Philippines was gallant, it was inevitably doomed. In February, General MacArthur received the order from President Roosevelt to leave. On the 12th, he boarded a motor torpedo boat under new orders to take command of the communications lines between Australia and America that were now coming under threat. As he left the Philippines, he famously declared, I shall return. The phrase became a rallying cry for the Allies. From his boat, MacArthur boarded a plane for Darwin. His B-17 Flying Fortress staggered into the air from Del Monte Airfield, Mindano, with one engine spluttering. The five-hour flight took him and his staff over the captured enemy islands of the Celebus, Timor, and the northern part of New Guinea. Somehow, they managed to avoid enemy Zero fighters. As they finally reached Darwin, they found that it was under Japanese attack, so they diverted to Bachelor Airfield about 50 miles away. When they eventually disembarked from the aircraft, a weary MacArthur remarked, It was close, but that's the way it is in war. You win or lose, live or die, and the difference is just an eyelash. <laughs> 
Some US Navy officers had given MacArthur only a one in five chance of escaping the Philippines. Via the radio airwaves, Tokyo Rose had boasted that the Japanese would capture him. But MacArthur and his family made it out. It was from this new Australian base that he would conduct the next phase of operations. It would be over two years before he could make good on his vow. In October of 1944, he returned to the Philippines at the head of the American invasion force. As we've already discovered, one of the main driving forces behind the Japanese policy of expansion was its need to replace the oil lost when America enforced its embargo. And so, with barely 18 months' supply of oil in reserve, the Imperial Japanese war machine invaded the oil-rich Dutch East Indies on January 11. A joint American, British, Dutch, Australian force under General Wavell had been formed to protect the curving chain of islands that begins in the northwest with Sumatra and continues south and east through Java, Bali, Flores and Timor, the latter just 400 miles off the coast of Darwin, Australia. When General Wavell took command, the outlook was not good. Dutch forces were scattered across the islands in small garrisons. The air support was meager. There was no aircraft carrier to provide naval weight. The Japanese attacked southern Sumatra with 700 parachute troops on February 13th. The threat to Java was imminent. On orders from Churchill, General Wavell left for India. This left Dutch forces under the command of Admiral Helfrich, three Australian battalions, a squadron of British tanks and five squadrons of the RAF. Together, they engaged the Japanese in what became known as the Battle of the Java Sea. It was a gallant action, but the Japanese would not be halted. By the time the Japanese invasion forces arrived on land, the Allied Navy in Java ceased to exist. With no air cover or naval support, resistance on land was short. Admiral Helfrich surrendered on March the 8th. Meanwhile, the Imperial Japanese forces were moving down through the jungles of Malaya towards the prize that was Singapore. The British had been in residence since 1819 when Sir Thomas Stamford Bingley Raffles founded a trading post there. It soon became an important British outpost and Singapore's rapid growth and importance to the British East India Company ensured that the British were there to stay. In 1824, the status of Singapore as a British possession was cemented in an Anglo-Dutch treaty that divided the Malay archipelago between the two colonial powers, the British controlling the area north of the Straits of Malacca, including Penang, Malacca and Singapore, whilst the area south of the Straits was assigned to the Dutch. Britain also had interests in Malaya to the north of Singapore Island. It had become an important source of rubber and tin. By 1910, the pattern of British rule in the Malaya lands was established. The Straits settlements were a crown colony ruled by a governor under the supervision of the colonial office in London. Their population may have been 50% Chinese, but all residents, regardless of race or creed, were British subjects. Subjects that now faced a Japanese invasion force. In 1940, as First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill had been responsible for Singapore's defences. He was convinced that should the island be attacked, it would be by sea. He informed his cabinet colleagues that 
Singapore is a fortress armed with five 15-inch guns and garrisoned by 20,000 men. It could only be taken after a siege by an army of at least 50,000. Furthermore, he noted that Singapore was as far from Japan as New York was from Southampton. He thought it impossible to maintain men and munitions over such a distance. He also didn't consider it plausible at that time that the Japanese, who he described as a prudent people, would extend themselves beyond the Yellow Sea in China, where they were already occupied. Surely they would not embark on so mad an enterprise so far from home. Churchill was wrong. He dispatched two battleships, HMS Prince of Wales and HMS Repulse. HMS Prince of Wales was a King George V-class battleship. The Prince of Wales had a brief but active career, helping to stop the Bismarck and carrying Churchill to the Newfoundland Conference. HMS Repulse was a renowned class battle cruiser, the second to last one built. She too had taken part in the chase of the Bismarck. The Admiralty had planned for an aircraft carrier to accompany the two ships, but the action never materialised. HMS Repulse left Singapore in company with HMS Prince of Wales and four destroyers to try and intercept the Japanese invasion convoys heading towards Malaya. But their hunt for invasion forces proved fruitless and they turned south. It was at this point that Japanese aircraft were spotted. The fleet was attacked by 86 planes. Without the protection of an aircraft carrier, the ships were very vulnerable. The force, the British thought to be an unsinkable deterrent, was sunk, leaving the coast of Malaya exposed. General Yamashita could now make a move. His assault on Singapore would be down through Malaya, and as the British had been slow to send troops north from Singapore, Malaya was badly defended. The Japanese first encountered resistance from the 3rd Corps of the Indian Army defending the coast. These were quickly isolated and forced to surrender. Although the Japanese 25th Army was outnumbered by the Allies, General Yamashita concentrated his forces. He had just 30,000 men, the Allies 100,000 more. But despite their numerical inferiority, the Japanese pressed forward hard. On January 14th, a company of Australians ambushed Japanese bicycle-mounted troops who were passing through a cutting that led to the bridge on the Sungai Gemenche River. Despite inflicting heavy casualties in their first major confrontation with the Japanese, the Australians were eventually forced to withdraw. The Allies were unprepared when the Japanese left the roads and moved swiftly through the jungle. The jungle had been expected to slow the Japanese advance, but the Japanese didn't ride in trucks, they walked and rode bicycles. With superior close air support, armour, coordination, tactics and experience played to their advantage. The British had underestimated the military capabilities of their foe. The assortment of untrained pilots and inferior Allied equipment in Malaya, Borneo and Singapore at that time were no match for the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force. Their fighter aircraft, especially the Mitsubishi A6M0, was instrumental in achieving air superiority. Whilst fighting continued in Malaya, the Japanese continued the strategic bombing of Singapore. The British did their best to keep the bombers at bay with anti-aircraft fire for as long as ammunition was available. The governing powers began the evacuation of women and children. Some would never see their fathers and husbands again. As defeat loomed, all available ships were hastily loaded with fleeing civilians. 
The Empire Star, designed to carry a small number of passengers, was crammed with 2,000 refugees. But coordination broke down and the evacuation became chaotic. Enemy planes attacked the fleeing ships and thousands of civilians drowned. Others survived drowning, only to be murdered by Japanese troops as they struggled ashore on Bankar Island. With the Japanese advancing on Singapore, let's take a moment to look at events as they were played out in Europe. From the time that Hitler rose to power in 1933, he began to pass the Nuremberg Laws, stripping Jews of rights and citizenship. He had made no secret of his antipathy towards Jews and spoke often of their removal by any means. By 1941, the first extermination camps were being built. Beltek, Sobibor, Treblinka, Chelmno, Majdenik, and finally Auschwitz-Birkenau. On January 20, 1942, the Wannsee Conference was convened at Wannsee Villa, Berlin, a meeting to discuss the practicalities of mass murder. Though no order directly linking Adolf Hitler to the extermination of the Jews has ever been found, Rudolf Hess, commandant of the camp at Auschwitz, and Adolf Eichmann, who had been described as the architect of the Holocaust, both said such an order existed in the early summer of 1941. Writing in his diary, Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's Reich Minister of Propaganda, noted, Regarding the Jewish question, the Fuhrer is determined to clear the table now the World War has come. The destruction of the Jews must be its necessary consequence. We cannot be sentimental about it. It is not for us to feel sympathy with the Jews. At Fanzi, the plans for the final solution were laid. The mass extermination of Jews began soon after. But the Nazi war machine would soon have an expanded Allied force to reckon with. The Americans were already fighting the Japanese in the Pacific, and now they were about to enter the fray in Europe, with some 4,000 troops landing in Northern Ireland. These were the first US troops to set foot on European soil since the American expeditionary troops left at the end of the Great War. They were greeted by Sir Archibald Sinclair, Secretary of State for Air, with the words, Your safe arrival here marks the new stage in the World War. It is a gloomy portent for Mr. Hitler, nor will its significance be lost on General Tojo. In truth, the deployment of American troops in Britain had been in the planning since April 1941, eight months prior to the Pearl Harbor attack. U.S. contractors had already been hard at work building bases for the 87,000 Americans the U.S. War Department planned to send. For the GIs, life in Britain took some getting used to. For a start, they drove on the wrong side of the road, and the BBC's wireless programmes were not exactly what they'd been used to. The United States War Department distributed a handbook, Instructions for American Servicemen in Britain, to advise them on the peculiarities of the British, their country and their ways. The guide was intended to alleviate the culture shock for soldiers taking their first trip to Great Britain, or for that matter abroad. One passage read, The British don't know how to make a good cup of coffee. You don't know how to make a good cup of tea. It's an even swap. There were explanations of everything the GI might encounter, from weights and measures to money, rationing and sports. Baseball may have been the national pastime back home, but in Britain, cricket was the summer sport. For some Americans, the nuances of the game were just a little too exciting. Very well played, sir. 
the arrival in Britain of rich relations from across the Atlantic meant the arrival of American supplies. Suddenly, Brits, especially young women, were being offered items that had been rationed since 1940. Butter and bacon, sugar, jam and eggs. Cheese and canned fruit appeared on the kitchen table, and suddenly there was a plentiful supply of nylon stockings and chewing gum. On February 9th, the old saying, cleanliness is next to godliness, became a little harder to achieve. Soap went on the ration, but the Americans travelled with a plentiful supply. Everyone was keen to be seen to be doing their bit. The British royal family were no exception. On February 25th, Princess Elizabeth, the future Queen Elizabeth, signed up for war service. 6,000 miles away, the Allied forces were falling back from Malaya. Their 54-day campaign was over. To the consternation of the British, the Japanese were closing in on Singapore. As well as being an important strategic port, Singapore was the home of many who were supporting China. Financial support had come from the ethnic Han Chinese, support that contributed to the stalling of the Japanese advance in China. Yet one more reason for the Japanese to invade the island. The Allies hung on, facing a determined Japanese assault. For General Yamashita, it was a nervous time, as he would later recall my attack on Singapore was a bluff, a bluff that worked. I had 30,000 men and was outnumbered more than three to one. I knew that if I had to fight for long for Singapore, I would be beaten. That is why the surrender had to be at once. I was very frightened all the time that the British would discover our numerical weakness and lack of supplies and force me into disastrous street fighting. Singapore lay under the command of Lieutenant General Arthur Percival. At his disposal, he had roughly 100,000 military personnel from Australia, Great Britain and India, as well as soldiers raised in Malaya and Singapore. They prepared their defence. The Japanese strategy was a wily one. At midnight on February 7th, Japanese troops landed unopposed on Singapore's northeast coast and they gave the impression of an impending attack from that direction. However, the next day they began a strategic air and artillery attack on the northwest coast instead. By 9.30 that night, the first Japanese amphibious assault on Singapore was launched. Undeterred by heavy casualties suffered from Australian machine gunners, wave upon wave of Japanese troops landed successfully. By midnight, the Australian defence was broken. The following day, the Tenga airfield fell to the Japanese. Singapore turned her famous large-caliber coastal guns inland, at least those that were capable of turning but the guns were supplied with mainly armor-piercing shells, necessary to penetrate the hulls of armored warships, the very reason the guns were there. Had the guns been well supplied with high-explosive shells, the Japanese attackers would have suffered heavy casualties. The guns would have helped repel the Japanese advance. They didn't. With his troops well established on the northern shores, Yamashita's next objective was Bukit Timah, commanding the northwestern approach to Singapore town. Yamashita called upon Percival to surrender. Percival had strict orders to fight till the end. A bitter battle was fought where the Japanese 18th Division faced the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the Malay Regiment, supported by men from the Australian forces. The Allies fought stubbornly and kept the Japanese onslaught at bay until midnight of February 12th. But as the odds grew too great, the Malay regiment retreated. Up on Bukit Chandu, 
Allied soldiers ran out of ammunition, but refused to give up. They engaged the Japanese in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but it was no use. By the afternoon of February 14th, Bukit Chandu was taken. By this time, the Japanese advance had forced British troops to fall back to a perimeter around the municipality. This was their last defense. Around this, the Japanese converged. The end was imminent. The water supply fell to a critical level and supplies including food, fuel and ammunition were also running low. These reasons, along with mounting civilian casualties, led Percival to make the momentous decision to surrender. On February 15, 1942, at 6.15pm, in a makeshift conference room in the Ford Motor Company factory in Singapore, General Arthur Percival, for the Allies, surrendered the island to Lieutenant General Yamashito Tomoyuki. It was a magnificent victory for Japan, for the capture of Singapore signalled the end of British power in the Far East. On the part of the British, Percival's telegram to the Supreme Commander of the American-British-Dutch-Australian Command read, All ranks have done their best. Of the 50,000 white troops captured in Singapore, 18,000 would die of disease or mistreatment in the next three years and eight months. The Japanese made the island the headquarters of the Southern Army, renaming Singapore Shonan, meaning Light of the South. The Japanese now had the riches of Malaysia at their disposal and had gained control of the streets of Malacca, the main sea lane between the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Following the British defeat at Singapore, nationalist movements began to realize that the old colonial powers were not the superior, unbeatable force they had believed, a point that marks the beginning of the decline of the empire. From here, we can trace the downward spiral of British colonial powers. With Singapore fallen, elsewhere the British Empire was under attack. Just before 10 o'clock, on February 19th, 188 Japanese planes descended upon Darwin in what was to be a precision strike. It marked the beginning of raids against Australia that would last into 1943. The Australians saw it as their Pearl Harbor, and although Darwin held nothing like the same significance as the American target in Hawaii, a greater number of bombs were dropped. Darwin was unprepared. Eight ships in the harbor were sunk, including an American destroyer, the USS Perry. A further 35 ships were damaged. None of the small number of available Allied planes managed to take off. All were destroyed or damaged. In just 40 minutes, the Japanese planes had achieved their goal and they turned for home. But another wave was to come. This time, there were 54 Japanese bombers. Their target, the town and Darwin Airfield. 250 dockside and port workers lost their lives that day. Somewhere between three and 400 were wounded. The true casualty figures were suppressed by the Australian government for fear of mass panic, but nonetheless, chaos ensued. Although February 19th was a day for Japanese rejoicing, before the summer was out, the four Imperial aircraft carriers involved in the attack would in fact be sunk during the Battle of Midway. Whilst the Japanese forces were winning the day in the Pacific, their countrymen were experiencing something very different in America, where thousands of their citizens had made their home. After Pearl Harbor, a Japanese face in America was not a welcome face. 
In reality, relations between the Japanese community and the wider American public had been crumbling for years. Farmers who resented competing against immigrant labor could now argue loyalty to the United States as a reason to mistrust anyone with a Japanese background. Even before Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt had ordered the names and addresses of each American-born and foreign-born Japanese to be collected. All enemy aliens in California, Oregon, Washington, Montana, Idaho, Utah and Nevada were ordered to surrender what was described as contraband. This included shortwave radios, cameras, binoculars, and various weapons such as hunting knives and the dynamite used by farmers to clear land. Los Angeles Congressman Leyland Ford wrote, I do not believe that we could be any too strict in our consideration of the Japanese in the face of the treacherous way in which they do things. California voted to bar all descendants of natives with whom the United States is at war from all civil service positions. Prohibited zones were established, places forbidden to all enemy aliens. The German, Italian and Japanese were ordered to leave the San Francisco waterfront areas. Soon, anyone designated an undesirable alien was moved from coastal locations of the US. California's Attorney General Earl Warren called Japanese Californians the Achilles heel of the entire civilian defense effort and warned unless something is done, it may bring about a repetition of Pearl. Farms were transferred from the hands of Japanese Americans to Caucasian tenants and corporations. Of primary concern was the continuation of production at full capacity. Japanese American farmers were told to continue their farm activities in the time before eviction and that destruction of crops would be punished as sabotage. On February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signed an executive order that began the roundup and evacuation of 120,000 Japanese Americans to one of 10 internment camps, officially called relocation centers. While Japanese Americans comprised the overwhelming majority of those in the camps, thousands of Americans of German, Italian and other European descent were also forced to relocate there. Though conditions were not good, they were nothing like the concentration camps set up by the Nazis. In Europe, the Nazis were not having it all their own way. Although German troops continued to lay siege to the Russian city of Leningrad, the city refused to fall. Leningrad was one of the primary targets of Hitler's Operation Barbarossa. He had expected it to fall like a leaf. The first shells fell on Leningrad on September 8, 1941. The Red Army had been outflanked when the Germans encircled the city. But the city did not fall as Hitler imagined it would. It fought back and continued to fight back for 900 days. The city's almost 3 million civilians, including about 400,000 children, refused to surrender. Instead, they endured rapidly increasing hardships. January and February saw Leningrad plunged into the depths of an extremely cold winter. Lack of fuel meant that the use of electricity in homes was banned. Industry and the military took priority. Kerosene for oil lamps was unattainable. Wood became the major source of heat in homes, with furniture and floorboards being burned in most of them. The food needed to fight the cold was simply not available. If bread was obtainable, people had to line up in the bitter cold in the hope that some might be left by the time they got to the front of the queue. Over January and February, 200,000 people died of cold and starvation. Despite these tragic losses and the inhuman conditions, the city's war industries still continued to work. With no heating, 
no water supply, almost no electricity, and very little left to eat, the city still refused to succumb to the Nazis. The Germans were discovering that their enemies still had a lot of fight left in them, and while the Russians were holding out against Hitler, Winston Churchill was plotting the next phase of the war against him. In the corridors of power, the British Prime Minister's words rang loud in the ears of his military strategists. The Navy can lose us the war, he said, but only the RAF can win it. Our supreme effort must be to gain overwhelming mastery of the air. The fighters are our salvation, but the bombers alone provide the means of victory. On Valentine's Day 1942, Bomber Command issued Directive No. 22, which ended the recent period of aircraft conservation by the RAF, although attacks were still not to be pressed in the face of bad weather or extreme hazard. With the new Lancaster bomber entering service and equipped with a new navigation device called GEE, Bomber Command hoped that locating targets would be made much easier. Nine days later, one of the most influential figures of the Second World War took up his new command. Air Marshal Arthur Bomber Harris was appointed Commander-in-Chief of Bomber Command. Harris had a reputation of being a determined and forceful character. Harris was totally convinced that the bombing of Germany could bring the Nazis to their knees and strike a decisive blow towards winning the war. In early March, his bombers hit the Nazi-held Renault plant in the Paris suburb of Billancourt. Serious damage was done to the production facilities, although many French workers were killed. However, this successful raid was a much-needed morale boost for the bomber crews. On this same night, the Lancaster bomber made its operational debut, laying mines off the French port of Brest. Of the 235 RAF planes that took off, only one failed to return. Five days later, the RAF made a raid on Essen, home of a Krupps factory. Krupps produced submarines, tanks, artillery, naval guns, munitions and other armaments for the German military. Though the results were disappointing, the bombers returned again and again. Not only was the factory a target, but under the new directive, so was the city. It was a prelude of what was to come. Under the new tactical doctrine of area saturation bombing, the RAF launched 234 planes and a massive incendiary attack against Lübeck on the Baltic. It devastated the old city. Hitler was so incensed, he ordered the Luftwaffe to bomb historic British towns and cities in retaliation. But Harris did not waver from the belief in his plan. By the end of May, 900 bombers would be dispatched to lay waste to Cologne. With the bombers now taking the fight to Germany, the war in Europe began to turn in the direction of the Allies. Hitler would discover that the Allies were not prepared to lie down. He now faced a resurgent RAF, the might of America, and an obstinate foe in Russia. Although the Allies had suffered badly at the hands of the Japanese in the Pacific, the foundations of a fight back there were already being laid. With the arrival of American troops in Numia, New Caledonia, plans were already taking shape that would see the American conquest of Guadalcanal, the first of a catalogue of amphibious assaults on Pacific Islands. With both the Battle of the Coral Sea and the Battle of Midway on the horizon, the Japanese would soon realize that the relatively easy ride they had in taking their new possessions would come to an end. The Allies were fighting back.